This video is brought to you by Dice.com. More on them in a little. Data science can be an incredible field to work in, but it can also be a daunting field to break into. While data jobs are becoming increasingly abundant, many people are still seeing rejection after rejection when applying. In this video, I break down five of the top reasons why you haven't landed a job in data yet. Of course, I also give you my best recommendations on what you can do to increase your chances of landing your first position or any subsequent position. You heard me correctly in that intro. The number of data jobs is increasing year over year. I've linked a past video in the description for you to watch after this one that gives you my analysis of the data science job market. That being said, the supply of data job candidates has definitely increased over time as well. What many people don't know is that the supply and the demand dynamics between data roles is fairly imbalanced. Let's look at some of the major role types within the data domain. First, you have the data scientist position. This is probably the position that has the most hype around it. While there's a ton of hype, the absolute number of data science jobs out there isn't that high compared to some other roles. The candidates that stand out the most and have the most experience generally have the best chance at landing these roles. In comparison to data scientist roles, there are abundant data analyst positions that have the same level or slightly less hype. If we're looking at this in terms of supply and demand again, you have a far higher chance of landing one of these data analyst roles, especially earlier in your career. In my mind, the data analyst roles are a fast track into eventual data science positions, and I describe what that transition looks like in a video I've linked above. Finally, let's look at data engineering roles. Data engineering has had a massive boom in popularity recently. The demand from companies is massive, but most people don't look at it as quite as, I guess, sexy as data science. Thus, the supply of candidates is a bit lower. Because of the massive demand from companies and the lower supply of engineers, the pay for data engineers, at least in the US, is surpassing that of data scientists. This is a slightly convoluted way for me to get to my first point, which is to think very carefully about the roles that you're applying for. Think about what companies to apply to based on supply and demand, based on your current skill set and experience, and what position gives you the best shot at breaking in. I'll let you in on a little secret. Once you land your first data job, it's far easier to land another one, even if it's a slightly different type of data role than the first job that you landed. Ah, so I see you're applying for the data scientist position here at Papaya Enterprises. Here's your first interview question. You have a candidate applying for new positions at many different companies. What data would you collect to help them land their first role? How would you use that data to help them generate a funnel for jobs and eventually get them that first position? It drives me crazy that most people who wanna be data analysts or data scientists don't treat the job search like a data problem. That's exactly what it is. You should be using data that you're collecting to help you land your job. The first thing you should pay attention to is hit rate. How often are you getting interviews? You might say to me, Ken, I'm only getting callbacks 5% of the time. I'm doing terrible. The funny thing is, is that if you looked at the data, you'd realize that 5% is actually pretty good compared to the average candidate. After further inspection, you might want to run an experiment. As you may or may not know, experimentation and A-B testing is a huge part of data science. You might compare your success rates applying to job boards versus cold emails or LinkedIn messages. I wonder which channel you'd have the most success with. Maybe within those messages, you could try different approaches and evaluate their success. If you wanted to go even further, you could look at maybe 20 different job postings that you're most excited about and see where your skills are in the highest demand. You could use that as a roadmap for your learning and your progression. You could also expand on that by scraping even more job postings or position details. There's so much you can do to analyze this market to help you on your journey. Admittedly, good data scientists work smarter and not harder, so I do have a video where I go over some of the data job collection data that I've linked above and in the description. Part of treating the job search like a data problem has to do with understanding the outcomes that you'd like to create. Let's run a simple scenario real quick. Which position would you rather be in? Scenario one, you apply for 100 jobs and in each job, you're exactly the 20th best candidate. In scenario two, you apply to those same 100 jobs, but in 10 jobs, you're a random position in the top 10 candidates and in the remaining 90, you're the bottom 20% of candidates. In scenario one, you're the 80th percentile candidate, while in scenario two, you're the 19th percentile candidate. Which one would you choose? The funny thing about scenario one is you probably won't land a single job in your search. In every interview, there's 20 candidates ahead of you in every single company. On the other hand, in scenario two, you're very likely to land a role. Another little secret is that the job process is not an aggregate benefit equation. It's a maximization problem for each interview. The sad truth is that very people will be able to maximize in every interview, and you should carefully pick and choose the places that you apply to give you the best shot at landing your position. You also have to be fairly careful with your time and your resume and your portfolio and target them for specific roles. Be sure to stay tuned for the last tip because I talk about how you can maximize your chances at the individual interview level there. Now, not all job opportunities are built the same. There are some channels that you can go through that greatly increase your probability for landing a job. For example, if I get referred to a position by a current employee, 
my chances of getting an interview and eventually a job go up dramatically. Earlier in the video, I talked about reaching out channels, but you can also have different channels that you apply through. You can find positions through your network, you could go through your university platform, you could go through a recruiter, or you could go through a job posting website. Surprisingly, depending on the stage of your career, the success across these different channels can vary. My friend Jeff Lee tracked his success across these different channels as he progressed through his data science career from you know, a data analyst to a data scientist and eventually a senior data scientist. And he found that the direct reach out and going through his network had the greatest success early in his career. But as he reached a senior level, job posting websites were actually very fruitful for him. I've linked his blog post about this in the description below. Needless to say, you should experiment with where you look for positions and how you reach out because they can have tremendous impacts on your outcomes. This is also a perfect time to talk about the sponsor of this video, Dice.com. Not all job posting websites are created the same. Dice.com is a tech-focused career platform built to empower technologists and the organizations who rely on them. While Dice is a platform with postings for exclusively technology jobs, they offer so much more. They have one of the best filtering systems I've seen to help you narrow down your search to those companies that you know you can maximize on. They also have resources that allow you to analyze how you fit into the job market. Probably my favorite part about DICE's offering is the DICE Tech Salary Report. I love this because they're doing a lot of the data analysis for you. They break out pay by role and by skill, and they even show you how this data changes over time. Salary is a reasonable proxy for the supply and demand equation, so you can potentially use this to level up with DICE and evaluate what skills you should be learning next. Finally, DICE offers access to career events and meetups, which are a great way to meet people that help you to land your position. Meeting people is a perfect segue into our next point, which is networking. I know you're probably tempted to leave when I start talking about networking, but don't do it. I'm sure you've heard that networking is important, but you probably think it isn't for you or you simply refuse to do it. I'm gonna try and change your mind. Let me ask you a rhetorical question. Would you rather have to reach out to find job opportunities or would you rather have the opportunities that you want come to you? Networking is a simple inversion of the job equation. By putting yourself out there, you create a funnel for opportunities to come straight into your inbox. With that definition of networking, even for the most introverted people, it might become quite desirable. In 2022, we can literally network from our couch while eating papayas. In theory, you literally don't have to talk to a single person these days to network either. I personally love a good old fashioned real live networking event, and I, I actually genuinely hope to see many of you at some of the ones I go to this year. But that simply isn't the only way networking works these days. So how can you network without talking to people? The easiest way is to just share things that you produce. If you're sharing useful and interesting things, people will naturally gravitate to you and share your work. You could do this via blog, via any of the main social platforms, or even via GitHub. Heck, in theory, you could do this anonymously. While you don't necessarily have to talk to people, I do highly recommend interacting with people. I quite enjoy it when people share their thoughts on my work or they even analyze my data. I've actually hired quite a few people or paid them for work based on my previous interactions with them on my various communities. If networking can bring you opportunities and you don't even have to do the scariest part about it, why wouldn't you do it? Now, the last reason people don't land a job is because of their portfolio. I've made about a zillion videos on data science projects so far, but I think that this concept I'm about to share might hit just a little bit different. Before I go into why your portfolio hasn't helped you land a job yet, I want you to answer a question for me in the comment section. What do you hope to show with your portfolio? Go ahead, pause the video, respond, and then I'll, I'll be waiting for you. Okay, now that you're back, I'm gonna tell you why that question is important. I find that most people have a general answer to the question I just asked. They wanna show that they have the prerequisite skills for data science. They also wanna show that they just have this baseline of work that they're capable of doing. While there is some value to that, it isn't the main reason you should have one of these portfolios. Your portfolio should show how you're different from other candidates and not how you're the same as them. By creating a baseline showcase of your skills in your portfolio, you're just lumping yourself together with these other candidates, right? Unless you're truly differentiating. Your portfolio is the single best way that you can maximize at each individual interview. I'm doing a lot of hypothetical scenarios in this video, so I guess another one really won't hurt, but let's say you're an employer at a healthcare company and you had two data scientists applying for the same position. Let's also say these two candidates were virtually identical aside from their portfolios. Data scientist A gives you a really well-documented portfolio with good projects and a clear showcase of skills. These projects are from a random assortment of data sets that the candidate thought was interesting. On the other hand, candidate B has fewer projects, but they're all directly related to either healthcare or insurance, and they show a clear relevance to the position at hand. Which candidate would you pick? I've honestly been in that exact position to hire someone, and guess what? it was a unanimous decision in the company to pick candidate B. What I've learned is that it's pretty hard to truly differentiate on technical skills. It's far easier to impress someone with subject area knowledge, communication skills, or creativity. You could do all of this within your portfolio. And based on the example above, you might think, Ken, 
Should I build a new project for every single company that I apply to? That definitely does not have to be the case. If candidate B applied to 15 different healthcare data roles, she could use that same portfolio for all of them. She could also apply to data science roles and insurance as well. Think about what field you're interested in and which ones are complementary, and this will help you narrow your search in a really positive way. While you can't play the volume game with your job search in this way, I believe you have a far greater chance of maximizing in each individual opportunity and eventually landing your first role. I realize that this might sound like heresy for those earlier in their career. I actually think this is even more valuable then. If you're competing for roles against other people who are recent graduates, having a clear differentiator can work even more in your favor. The hard thing might be figuring out what you're actually interested in and what you want to pursue, and maybe I can make another video on that topic sometime soon. Hopefully this video helped you to think about the job search a little bit differently. Special thanks to DICE for sponsoring this video as well. If anything here does eventually help you to land a data role, please let me know. I would love to celebrate with you. Until next time, good luck on your data science journey.